Too many days in the darkness. Welcome to Provisioner's Cure, brought to you by Precure.com, the podcast where we challenge mainstream conventional medicine and look to the latest science and practice around the things that really make us healthy. We dive deeper into what you can do to prevent, manage disease, to have a long and healthy life. This podcast aims to be right on the cutting edge with the best scientists and practitioners in their fields in the world. Prevention is Cure. I'm your host, Professor Grant Schofield. Today I'm talking to Dr. Matthew Phillips, who's a neurologist based in Hamilton, which is in the Waikato area of New Zealand. He is a really interesting guy. He describes himself as a metabolic neurologist, which so far as I can tell is the first time a neurologist has done that. He is keenly interested in fasting and diet as a means of rejuvenating the brain across a variety of conditions. He manages to do a lot of things, given he works full-time as a consultant in the hospital, but also manages to research and conduct his own randomized trials, and we'll talk about a bunch of those across a range of diseases. Now, honestly, so far as podcasts are concerned, this has been the most interesting one I've ever done. I think the material that he pops up and the challenges he poses there, his ideas around fasting, which on first instance mine seem pretty extreme, are fascinating. His ideas around mitochondria, uh, mitochondria health is an important part of health and how we access the ability to optimize our mitochondrial function are just huge. So without further ado, let's just get straight into it and I really hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Hi there, welcome to a Precure Prevention is Cure podcast with me, Professor Grant Stafford, and it's a real treat today. Joining me is urologist, Dr. Matthew Phillips. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Grant. It's great to be here. Uh, just before we started, we were lamenting about the fact that we really live two hours away from each other by driving, and... Uh, we've had pretty much the same interests in low carbon keto diets and fasting for a number of years and been doing work in that area. We hadn't actually even met until uh, just a month or so ago at the general practice conference. So um, I've been so keen to catch up with you and talk about the amazing work you do for so long. So thanks for coming on. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, likewise, I've heard your name for years, so it's, it's about time. So just so people who don't know, because it's what what is a neurologist and how does one become a neurologist and what 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 does a neurologist actually do? Yeah, very good question. So when when you talk about neurology, people understand it's about the brain and spinal cord. We also study peripheral nerves and muscles quite a bit. Um, I guess neurosurgeons are our cousins, and their job is easy to conceptualize because they have a you know spend a lot of time in theater and and uh, operate. They deal with a lot of uh, tumors and trauma and bleeds and things like that. Neurologists deal with everything else, which is strokes and epilepsy and Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis and all these things. And, and it's a lot more, actually. And what we do is we, first of all, these things are not always easy to diagnose. So we, we spend a lot of time talking to people in clinics or seeing patients on the wards and trying to do uh, proper histories and examinations and investigations, blood tests, scans, and so on to try and figure out the diagnosis. And then once we've done that, we enter this long period uh, with most neurological disorders where we manage them for months and years, and we try to make people uh, feel as good as we can and mitigate the symptoms. Of course, most of the neurological disorders continue to progress onwards, and this is why I became uh, some years ago quite dissatisfied at the idea of just managing these disorders, and I really wanted to help people um, at a deeper level, maybe we could slow down or restore some of their previous uh, function and health in these disorders. But that is basically what neurologists do. We, we make diagnoses and then we manage by following people for a number of years, trying medications and stuff to uh, make them feel better. And when does something become psychiatric rather than neurological? Oh, another great question. So, uh, yeah, so it's interesting. Um, Psychiatry and neurology, and of course, psychology, all 
uh, involve people that are quite good at what they do and they specialize in the brain. And so why do we have three separate fields? Well, uh, I guess part of it is how each of the three different fields understands the brain, how it works. I, I think uh, neurologists are really good at studying diseases. Uh, what we see as diseases or disorders of the brain. If you ask a neurologist how the brain works, actually, most of them don't know that much. They are very good at the disorders of the brain. Whereas psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, I think psychologists might have a, arguably the best grasp of how the brain works on a processing level. It depends on the psychologist. And psychiatrists deal with different disorders of the brain that we really don't know much. We don't know a lot about neurological disorders, but we know very little about a lot of the psychiatric disorders. And so I think that it's just that the psychiatric disorders, um, it takes a different kind of way to conceptualize them. And, uh, and it's somewhat different, the treatment and the history taking and the examination, everything compared to a neurologist. So I think the fields were divided on that end, but basically two different fields study the brain. It's just the way they conceptualize it is different and the disorders, the treatment patterns are quite different. So. Is it too cynical to say that the ones that ended up in psychiatry are the ones that we just don't know enough about? No, I don't think it's too cynical. I think that's a large degree of re realism there. Look, uh, I know that um, there are people, uh, for example, example, Dr. Chris Palmer, who's, I believe, coming out of the book in a couple months about this, think that a lot of uh, psychiatry, psychiatric disorders have a strong metabolic aspect underlying them. And so therefore, there may be benefits to uh, metabolic strategies such as fasting ketogenic diets in these psychiatric disorders. And we're talking about things like bipolar disorder, um, depression, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, perhaps, and so on. So uh, I think, yeah, but currently we, we have this, we don't really know what's going on. So we try drugs to mask the symptoms, but it would be nice if we could um, help people with psychiatric disorders get better at a more fundamental level. I don't deny it. So you've mentioned the word metabolic a few times, and if you go to metabolicneurologist.com, you'll find your website. Yeah. So you, you go by the title of a metabolic neurologist. I hadn't heard of a metabolic neurologist until I've met you. Why, why, what is a metabolic neurologist, and how did you come to think of yourself as one of those? Well, to my knowledge, prior to me adopting the title, metabolic Neurology didn't really exist. I mean, people study it in some way, shape, or form, but to t come out and say, here's a new subfield of metabolic neurology, and I'm a metabolic neurologist, I think, I think I'm still the only person really doing that. And, and you know, part of it's a, you know, what you think you become kind of thing. So I'm trying to propel this concept. But I do think metabolic neurology will be a, a field of importance in the future. What is a metabolic neurologist? It is a person who, first of all, uh, conceptualizes that. Most of the lifestyle-related disorders, uh, many of which are in neurology, for example, uh, Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative disorders would be a good example, uh, have a underlying metabolic basis. And metabolism just is a word that describes all the chemical and biochemical reactions in your body and all your cells and in your mitochondria, which are the batteries of the cells. And a metabolic neurologist realizes that maybe mitochondria dysfunction is the problem, the core issue with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, other neurodegenerative disorders, and maybe brain, you know, forms of brain cancer and so on. And therefore, if that is so, then the best way to address these disorders is to use some medications to help people feel better, but recognize as a metabolic neurologist that medications don't actually slow down or reverse these disorders at all. And we want to also use therapies that maybe can do that, which changes the whole thing from medications being the main game to suddenly these metabolic therapies or metabolic strategies, what I call them, to being the main game. And metabolic strategies, which I'm sure we'll get into, involve things like um, proper fasting protocols, ketogenic diets, and specialized forms of exercise and so on. Okay, so I guess the, you, the, the other thing that came up there a bit, which... I suppose we need to explore is this idea of the mitochondria as you talked about them as the batteries or the energy suppliers of the, of, of cellular metabolism and well, all cells in the, every cell in the body has got mitochondria, right? They, uh, and so you've got a special understanding and interest in, in how that works and how things might go 
not how they should in that in that particular part of the of each cell. Yeah, that's right. So um, if you look at these disorders, uh, you know, cancer, dis- uh, cancer anywhere, but cancers of the brain, such as glioblastoma multiform, and also the neurodegenerative disorders, uh, the most common is Alzheimer's disease, followed by things like Parkinson's, frontotemporal dementia, and so on. Mitochondria dysfunction is a very strong element underpinning all of it in both disorders. It's just that in the neurodegenerative disorders, the mitochondria dysfunction is in the neurons, whereas in uh, cancer, say, even cancers of the brain, virtually always the mitochondria dysfunction is not in the neurons, but in these support cells around the neurons called glial cells, which are really important. And there's about as many of them as there are neurons in the brain. So uh, the mitochondria dysfunction takes many forms. They look very odd. So they look, uh, their shapes are messed up. They're supposed to be nice and ellipsoid. And in cancer, for example, in in our Alzheimer's, they're too round or too long, too skinny. They're also supposed to join up fusion and split apart fission routinely in a healthy mitochondria population. And they don't do that very well in either of these disorders. And there's other things. Mitochondria are supposed to... um, be able to do things like uh, couple and uncouple their energy production from heat production. So if they, um, this is a bit of a funny concept to understand, but if they, if they're properly, um, if they can uncouple properly, then they uh, are able to get rid of a lot of free radical energy in the form of heat and so on. Whereas, uh, you know, I think it's that ability to couple and uncouple is very important. And that's probably messed up in these disorders too. There's many other ways they're messed up. Uh, they, Mitogenesis is screwed up, so mitochondria constantly renew themselves, and this does not occur very well in these disorders. And mitophagy is another thing on the other end of the spectrum of their life, where you know you mitochondria are supposed to sort of um, get rid of the old junky ones periodically, so that new ones can come come on board, and that is messed up too. So there's a whole range of mitochondria problems in cancer and cancers of the brain and Alzheimer's. It- you talked about two things. I just want to explore a little bit more this idea of fusion and fission. So normal mitochondria will sometimes join together. What's going on there? Sometimes split apart. Why are they doing that? Okay. Yeah. So uh, first of all, there are hundreds, if not thousands of mitochondria per cell in most cells of the body. Neurons are particularly packed with them because they rely a lot on mitochondria and uh, they don't have a lot of the enzymes for glycolysis, which is another energy pathway, as you know, Grant. What uh, we think happens when mitochondria come together and fuse is um, they just basically, it's that. They, you have, a, say, two mitochondria, they come together and they join up. And through this process, perhaps uh, the more damaged mitochondria, you know, the damage can be reduced or mitigated by uh, adopting characteristics of the healthier one. And with uh, fission, which is mitochondria splitting, so, you know, uh, neurons have little small spaces and terminals and things, and sometimes big mitochondria might not be able to get in there. Fission is important because it allows them to get smaller and move into these spaces and get the energy within the neuron where it needs to be. And remember, neurons, some of these neurons are up to a meter long. They're very, very long. And so mitochondria need to move all around the neuron at all times in order to get the energy where it needs to be. Yeah, that's just an amazing sort of. Uh, just, I, I am always amazed when we start to think about how the body works and how biology has got to this point of uh, evolving. Uh, there's also an idea that 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 mitochondria have different mitochondrial DNA is different. Is that, is that a thing? From, nu- from nuclear DNA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, my, uh, it, from the, uh, how, how I they think even you're right. There? Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, from the standpoint, okay, so the idea is um, that mitochondria were originally a very uh, ancient form of bacteria that um, sort of developed this uh symbiotic symbiotic relationship with these cells and now they provide the energy for the cells and the cells give them a nice stable home and 
I guess from a mitochondria dysfunction standpoint, um, they would have therefore two different uh, genomes, uh, sets of DNA, one within the mitochondria that they used to use, and then one for the cell. And now, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of mixing up uh, together. So a lot of the, the sort of cell genome, uh, the genes make things for the mitochondria and vice versa. From a mitochondria dysfunction standpoint, the most uh, important part of this to me is that probably the repair systems for the nuclear genome, the nuclear DNA, are better, more efficient than the ones for the mitochondria. And so damage can potentially accrue or build up in the mitochondria DNA um, genome more easily. And, and this could lead to mitochondria dysfunction more selectively within the cell rather than uh, you know, the cell itself getting damaged. But if a mitochondria-centric theory is correct, that's a, uh, where mitochondria are the aspect of health that's most important, which is what I believe, then uh, that's a problem. You need to uh, really take extra care of your mitochondria. And I should also say, <clears throat> although mitochondria are often seen as the batteries of cells, from a mitochondria-centric perspective, and this is the way I see it now, Mitochondria is what we are made of primarily, not cells. Cells are just houses for mitochondria. <laughs> I love it. That's okay, an important mindset. That's an important. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's an important yeah, yeah, mindset. That, yeah, that, yeah, that is a very um, big mindset, isn't it? Because we think of cells. Every cell in the body, every cell it in the body, is. Okay, it is housing these super important energy producing thing. Okay, so so go, go going back there. There's this sort of idea back in the in the days of the primordial soup. We've got these. Uh, single cell amoebae type organisms that, that they've somehow taken on board bacteria that are able to act in a way that actually makes them more uh, more more of a functioning cell and those evolve preferentially and away we go from there. So Matt, let's just come back to your, your training. You trained as a neurologist. You, you sound Canadian. You're from Canada. You're from Canada originally. Yeah, I grew up in Canada. I lived there until I was 26. And then I went to Australia to uh, study medicine. And I decided to stay there because I liked it. And yep. during the, during that time, I was interested in neurology. But yeah, I am originally Canadian. And then you, when you finish, what normally happens is that you will end up specializing in, a, in even a, a, a more... Uh, specialist area of neurology, you might become a Parkinson's expert or an Alzheimer's expert. Is that the normal pathway for neurologists? Yep. Normal pathway for neurology is you do a number of years of training after medical school, and in my case, seven. And then you would specialize in a disorder, generally a disorder such as stroke or epilepsy or Parkinson's and so on. And then you'd be a sort of a specialist in that, but still able to manage the other disorders as well. I guess I didn't like that path, and so I went along a different path. Okay, let's talk about that because I'm fascinated with what's going to come up next. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, after, when I finished my neurology training in uh, 2012 at Royal Melbourne Hospital, which was a very good training hospital with excellent people, I was a bit lost because I didn't want to specialize in a disorder. I wanted to do more. I was uh, very unsatisfied by seeing my patients with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, the cancers, of course, and so on. Not really getting better for the most part. Like we're, we're able to make their quality of life better and in mitigate the symptoms with the medications. They're good at that. And I'm not against medications, but I wanted to try and help them at a deeper level. And so I didn't see how I could do that with all my options of specializing in different fellowship programs and whatnot. I, so I, I decided to just take a break and I thought about why is that? Why is, am I a doctor of medicine now? And I, and, and I can't, I want to make people healthier, like sort of try and cure them rather than just manage them. And yet I don't really have an option for doing that. So I, I just took through a year out of the medical system and I guess it was a, almost in a way a self-imposed fellowship where I just let myself uh, travel and volunteer in different countries for a while and try to see what the world would give me. And I guess it uh, ended up being three years where I worked, traveled, and volunteered in different places around the world. And uh, during that time, I, I 
tried really hard. I mean, I had some fun too, don't get me wrong, but I tried really hard to learn about what might be a good path for helping people. So I looked into a lot of things like, you know, stem cells and, uh, you know, fasting and ketogenic diets and different kinds of medications, many different things about what might help people with neurological disorders the most. And I ended up settling on the metabolic strategies it took three years. And then I decided, well, I can't specialize in this unless I do it. So I decided to take a job at Waikato Hospital, which was available. And um, I started doing clinical neurology and research on the side. And now the research is becoming quite predominant. That's basically it in a nutshell. So did you, did you, how did you come across ketogenic diets and fasting in that three years? You were just reading the literature or, and did you start to try this yourself and do your own N equals ones and, and what, what? Yeah, well, of course I started on myself. I, I, I don't remember, people ask me this, I don't remember how I first got into it. I think I had a couple of friends who maybe have mentioned it, mentioned it or, or through a few videos. Some of the earlier videos I remember seeing definitely were from Dominic D'Agostino and Thomas Seyfried, who I'm, uh, both of who are excellent uh, researchers and I've uh, you know, I've met them both. They're really nice people too. And I'm sure you know who they are. Mm. So uh, probably that influenced me. And Jason Fung influenced me a lot. His stuff, um, I was onto at a very um, early time when he came out with this obesity code book. Um, but I guess, um, yeah, after that, I, I started N of one experimentation. I think that was kind of neat because I, I just thought to myself, if I'm even going to think about putting a patient on a fasting protocol oh. or a ketogenic diet, and a lot of people are saying there's all these adverse effects, which I now know are false if you do them properly, then uh, I had to do it on myself to the nth degree first. So yes, I've done a lot of um, fasting and keto diet experimentation, including measuring the blood glucose, ketones, lipids, everything. And um, in, in quite a strict form and, I, and uh, trying different supplementation forms as well, coconut oil, MCT oil, artificial ketone esters, and so on, just to see what those effects of those things are. And um, yeah, I, and I guess it, for, for myself anyways, the best evidence. Uh, so uh, I believe in results over facts and I believe in facts over expert opinion in that order, but results are most important. So I'm still doing the fasting keto today, which is so, um, quite a number of years later. And I, I guess that uh, has led to a number of good results that I feel and see, uh, certainly on a biochemical level, I see them. And um, so I continue all that to this day. Uh, I'm pretty much always in ketosis. And uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, so I think you mentioned that at the last talk I saw you do that you were about to go away diving on a dive holiday and you were going to fast for some period of time that I don't recall. How, did you end up doing that fast and how long was it for and how, how did you feel? Yes, I did. So yeah, last time I saw you, I was uh, going on my, my first international trip really in th almost three years to the Maldives and I just went there for two weeks. And uh, what I always do when I travel on a flight to Canada or anywhere else in the world is I do a, a multi-day fast. I do not eat during the flight. First of all, it saves me from having to eat the airplane food. <laughs> and second of all, I find I can com almost completely mitigate jet lag uh, I, by doing a three, four, five-day fast. In this case, I did sort of a five-day one. And uh, I, then when I get to the new country, so I start the fast the day before I get on the plane. Then I, when I get to the new country, I will time my one meal, I always pretty much eat one meal a day anyways, OMAD. Uh, I will time that one meal for when I would normally eat it, which is normally in the early evening uh, in the new country. And then I find that I do not get jet lag uh, hardly at all. And wow. uh, for diving, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, I've only been doing it for, I guess, uh, three, four years, but I, I definitely am prone to jet lag if I do not do this. It's mitigated. So... The, uh, and of course, I hydrate on the plane and I'll make sure I take a, a little bit of salt supplementation at some point. So um, when I dive, uh, fasted for four or five days, first of all, I don't tell the diving operators uh, right away. I'm not sure how some of them would feel about it, just the idea of it. But I find that I feel really calm, excellent, and focused under the water, which makes sense. We know these things occur with a multi-day fast. And I'm not... Uh, advocating this for anyone unless you maybe have done a lot of fast too so uh 
please remember this is something I do and I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you doing this, but I find it's very beneficial for me and I find my dive time increases as well uh, significantly. And um, probably there are multiple reasons for that, but I enjoy doing the fasts and, uh, when I dive in particular. Yeah. It's interesting. I've just come off a five-day fast myself. Just I'm, I'm about uh, 16 hours out of that. So I'm feeling fantastic. And awesome. my wife and I try, try to do that once or twice a year. Uh, and we definitely go in, awesome. in, in a sort of yep. low-carb keto state. So uh, so this this uh, this idea of increased dive time and time underwater. So I, I've, I think one thing that's known is you've got to increase CO2 tolerance. I've heard of that, this sort of idea that they would have a, a lab rats and mice that they had on keto and ketosis, they normally euthanize them by putting them in a, a CO2 chamber uh, and that's how they yep. do it. And sometimes they would open up those ones and they'd just come running straight out again, uh, which is an interesting observation. And uh, Definitely. I, I mean, um, no, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, well, and I'd, I'd practice this thing. I'm not sure if you recommend this at all. You probably don't, but we've been driving along and I get to the same point. In Auckland, just when you go underneath the, just when you're approaching the Harbour Bridge from the south area and you go underneath this little tunnel at Fanshawe Street, and I'd, I'd, I'd mark it there, I'd, like, like I'd, I'll hold my breath from here and see how far I can get because you, you yeah. go around the motorway and you end up on top of the bridge. And, I, you know, at my best, I can get all the way to the, to the top of the Harbour Bridge, which is quite a long way away. And I was always surprised about that. And when I'm out of ketosis, I, it's just astonishing. I'm literally uh. a third of that. And then I'm like, <laughs> So yeah, yeah some, something's no, no, I, I find the same thing. Yeah. I find the exact same thing. And actually, uh, in the Maldives, I should mention, I was very lucky. I met the uh, Maldives current record holder for free diving. And he was diving. We, I dove with him pretty much every dive, a great guy. Yeah. Yeah. And he showed he's an excellent scuba diver as well. So he was talking about how, uh, you know, when to get these incredible uh, depths at free diving, like he's sort of been up to 86 meters. Uh, free diving. And uh, what you do is you have to make your body more tolerant to high, lo uh, high levels of carbon dioxide through, uh, you know, techniques such as what you just mentioned. And then, of course, I was speaking to him about ketosis and how that could even augment that. And he was quite uh, interested in that. So I, I don't, uh, I'm not surprised by your findings because I find the exact same thing. I cannot hold my breath as long when I'm, uh, say, just doing my normal ketogenic diet one meal a day as compared to day five of a fast. Yeah, I'd always wondered if that was a thing in the in that free diving community to be in fasting and ketosis, but uh, yeah, well, people can uh, it's, tell uh, us about Yeah, it's not yeah. to my knowledge. I mean, he was, yeah, he was really kind of, um, he had tried the ketogenic diet before for a few weeks, but uh, I think he hadn't really, uh, and this is a thing a lot of professional athletes uh, encounter is is your your performance probably goes down a little bit when you start a keto diet or maybe even an intermittent fasting protocol, like sort of 90, 95% for a few weeks or even months. And as a professional athlete, that's difficult to tolerate when you have competitions. You can't tolerate that yeah, adaptation period for too long. Yeah. So I think a lot of um, uh, times, uh, like, you know, it's someone like, uh, Peter Atia, who I think, you know, has described yeah. this, how, you know, he, he found that eventually his performance was as good as it was, or even better on a keto diet. But yeah, definitely for a num a, a period of time, you're, you have this adaptation period and it's normal, right? You're, you've totally changed the fuel source for your cells and so on. So, yeah, I've been yeah, thinking, I think I, about I think that a lot more because I think, yeah. There's, there's a couple of things there, I reckon, because yep. there's, there's obviously getting fat adapted. Um, and the athletes I've coached, yeah, the initial period, they you know, can double it, even triple their ability to burn fat at a you know, certain exercise intensity, which is interesting. Um, but, but actually, it, over a, a, quite a long period, like another couple of years, it seems to improve way more. Um, and you did right. I think initially their, their higher end performance where there's glycolytic pathways involved uh, tends to deteriorate. There's sort of some ideas about some enzymes that do that, but it, it definitely recovers. And I reckon it could be a six to nine month process and at least the cyclists and runners and triplets that I've worked with, which is, you know, as you say, it's a pretty long time, but to be not as good as you were. Oh, not, well, you would know better than I. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah so, you would know better uh, than I working with uh, athletes, but I, I would say it's, 
at least six to nine months for a high level athlete, probably one or two years. Mm. And so that's a pretty long term commitment to, to uh, eventually becoming yeah. more awesome. But yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, let's get back to 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 actual therapies and stuff because get that's the both. Uh, just just a couple more things to finish up on fasting. What what's the longest fast you've done? Fourteen days. Wow, and what was that like? Um, yeah, I, it was good. This was a couple of years ago. It, it was good. I found though in the second week for myself, um, maybe I, I, I was starting to have a little bit of the, uh, fatigue, um, more than I liked. I mean, remember I was working every day as a neurologist doing a busy on-call schedule and so on. So I find for myself, five days is ideal and no more than seven. And then I can keep working and I d- it's ideal for my own calls. It helps me sleep and so on. But I guess just didn't feel quite as good. Now, if I did a lot of 14-day fasts, that might change because my body would adapt. But I don't have that much body fat. And whereas someone who's overweight or obese, I think a 14-day fast, you'll find they can do that quite easily and feel very good and even longer ones. So. Yeah, that's for me. But yeah, um, what are you taking during the yeah. fast? So, uh, you mentioned salt. Is that a thing? So I mix them up. Uh, yeah. So sometimes I'll do a water only fast, which means uh, not just water, but some salt. You need about a teaspoon of salt a day to feel optimal. I find. Uh, I the most common fast I do though is a coffee fast. So I will do water and salt, and I will have uh, coffee up to four coffees a day. I try to go no more than that. And in the coffee, I will prefer it black or maybe a teaspoon or so of, of, uh, heavy cream, which is on yeah. pretty much a pure fat. And then occasionally, uh, if I decide I want to do some intense exercise, uh, during the fast, I'll do what's called a, uh, you know, a minimal calorie intake fast. I call them or basically I'll have a can of sardines or tuna, a small can every day. Uh, with some olive oil. And that will, um, I don't know that there's much evidence for this, but I feel as though um, having the protein hit uh, might be beneficial if I'm doing a particular heavy exercise regimen during that week of fasting. Oh, hey, interesting. Yeah, this, this sort of idea of people sort of call a protein sparing fast or, or something like that. that that's cool. And so yeah. then how often would you end up doing that, uh, a fast? How regular was she? So I was doing, yeah, I was doing a uh, average four or five day fast, four to seven day fast every month for a couple of years. In the last twelve months, I probably do one every two months. Uh, I find, I I don't know. I I've gone uh, more strictly one meal a day ketogenic diet in the last year as well, whereas before I was probably more two meals a day. So I find with the OMAD, I don't feel the same urge to fast as much. I get, often get this now, this urge that it's time for a fast. And I find that that urge is less. And I, I think that's your body saying it's time to, uh, you know, do this long fast where you can get additional renewal benefits for your mitochondria and so on. But yeah, every two months so, now, I'd say. What, what about this? We talked about mitochondria, but what about the immune system? That's a really interesting sort of side topic here on fasting. And for, for me, when I hear that and you, you've talked about one of your patients in fact she came along and presented at the at the new zealand gps conference serona which was fascinating but the sort of boosting of immune system or renewal of immune system is that a thing yeah so that's a good question grant um look i think the whole idea of restoring mitochondria function is is it's not that novel but it is novel in a sense that there's not a lot of research as to uh, first of all what is good optimize mitochondria health or function, and then next, how do you restore that? So uh, in terms of the mitochondria thing, this is why I advocate fasting. Fasting, it's not just about mitigating damage to mitochondria. It's it's giving them a few days or or a period of time to renew, undergo mitogenesis and mitophagy and other things that allows them to actually renew themselves. Now, um, when it comes to the immune system and and what uh, these metabolic strategies are doing there, um, there is some research out there, certainly in animals. Uh, I try to stick with human interventional tr- trials. Those are the best, but uh, I will use animal data when we don't have enough human stuff. 
uh, it seems as though uh, fasting can augment uh, immune system function and, and make uh, a number of the immune cells more efficient at what they do. And uh, maybe keto diet can do that too. We're, prob- we're often relegated to human observational studies where they can only look at correlations, um, unfortunately, as well, um, where maybe fasting and, and keto diets could be perceived as associated with improved um, immune system function and so on. But the, the research at the end of the day with regards to fasting, keto, and immunity is, is it's in, in its infancy, as it is in, in defining how what is good mitochondria and what is, you know, bad mitochondria function. So it's also new. I, I'd hesitate to really um, put too much weight on the data, but I do think uh, at the end of the day that uh, enhancement of immune system function is a big part or certainly a component of fasting ketogenic diet that could be potentially helpful in cancer and uh, other infectious disorders, disorders clearly and, and so on. And uh, yes, with the patient you mentioned, I think enhanced immune system function was a, probably a part of the mechanism. I, I've been thinking about it, and I have no real basis for this at all, um, other than what I was assuming was my basic knowledge in biology, that the autophagy that was being stimulated by the fast, then maybe the body would start to single out old I don't know, lymphocytes or other immune cell, cells involved in immunity and 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 recycle those ones, which it might not normally do if it was in a more anabolic state. Do you reckon there's any truth in that, or am I just making that up? Quite possibly. Uh, I mean, we just don't know enough about the mechanisms. Like everyone's, a lot of people talk about autophagy, which is cell recycling, and mitophagy, which is mitochondria recycling. But to be honest, we don't have that much research uh, going on asking the important questions, such as, how long do you need to fast, say, for autophagy or mitophagy to be optimal, and what is optimal, and how you know how much does a ketogenic diet induce these mechanisms, if at all, as well? So I think uh, you know when it comes to mechanism, there are a lot of possibilities, and the one you mentioned is certainly plausible. Uh, my approach uh, to these, in turn, from a research perspective, is to find out what works first uh, clinically and then work backwards as to mechanism. I think that's most important for the patients. And uh, you know, we, we, really, we really suffer from choosing the wrong outcome measures in a lot of trials. For example, uh, what is the most important thing in a condition like Alzheimer's? Well, it's improving cognition, improving function, and quality of life. That's it to the person. What's the most important thing in someone who has a terminal cancer diagnosis? Well, it's survival and quality of life. That, those are the most important things. So why measure some obscure biomarker that may or may not be relevant, but that's what most studies do, unfortunately. So we need to choose better outcome measures uh, as part of this whole thing. Okay, so let's follow that idea of building up evidence. So you, you're now in clinical practice. You are you would presumably, I mean, we'll talk about some of the clinical trials you've done in a moment, but presumably you would not going straight to clinical trials, you'd want us to see if you could try some of these therapies out with uh, with people. How do you how do you start that process? Given that these aren't conventional therapies, yeah. So, well, there's the N of one strategy, as as you mentioned. So you try it on yourself first, but uh, you start typically with in vitro studies. Um, you know, taking um, samples of cells or whatever, and, and looking at them in a sort of uh, outside of the body setting in a lab, or you start with animal studies. So you'll look at typically mice or rats and, and do these things in them. And then you build up to uh, animals that are closer to humans in the evolutionary tree, such as, uh, you know, primates. And then eventually you get to human trials. So that's the usual way. Uh, I think we have quite a bit of animal research in, in a lot in these metabolic strategies in a number of uh, fields certainly it's it's deficient in in many of them too though um, but that's usually it you you see if it works in animals first and then you want to translate it to humans and it's that whole translational medicine component that translational research that often falls flat on its face because what often works in a mouse or a rat does not work in a human at all so I would rather uh, I, I don't ignore the data from animal research. It's very important. 
It guides the human research, but I want to find out what works in a person and then work backwards as to mechanism. I, I might have the mechanism wrong in my head, but if it works in the person, that's what I care about. And it's finding out the truth of what works and what doesn't work and making sure you're not fooling yourself. That's not so easy. That's difficult, right? You can fool yourself easily too as the researcher. Um, but but if you think it's real, then you uh, it's sort of like, well, let's focus on this and then try to focus the next 10 years on working out the mechanism. In the meantime, we can help a lot of people. That's my approach. Uh, how, how do you get started on these, on these, on these treatments in, a, in the hospital setting though? So you've got a patient presenting ah. with Alzheimer's disease and are they, are, are patients coming, going to you going, I've heard of this stuff. Can I try it? Or does that ever happen? Or yeah. are you just going, you go, oh, hey, look, I can treat you with these medicines, but have you thought about changing these other things as well? How, how do you, how, do, how does, do either of those things happen or how do you do uh, it? I think for me, I had to get out of the hospital system for the three years there were basically, well, most of the three years where I, um, as I said, I, I traveled, worked in a, some hospitals and volunteered in, in uh, poor poor countries as well. But basically getting out of that system and then being open to new things yourself, you have to transform yourself first before you can transform any anyone else in terms of their thinking about things. And and. Part of that, it's a long process, I think, um, transforming your conception of the world of health, what is disease, what is what is not, and so on. And then basically when I started at Waikato, I had all these ideas in my head. I was, it was, I was seeing a lot of Parkinson's. Uh, as neurologists see a lot of Parkinson's. And so that was uh, people I kept seeing. I would just thought to myself, and I'd been thinking about it for a few months before, it was in Asia where I had the idea that uh, maybe we could just transform the metabolism of these people to make the, their brain sort of go into this hunter state. Um, you know, Parkinson's is, is a, it's a neurodegenerative disorder, um, but there's a certain uh, collection of symptoms associated with it. So a lot of them are the motor ones, the tremors and so on, but also most of it is these non-motor symptoms, which is sleep problems, fatigue, urinary problems, cognitive problems, and so on. I just thought maybe it's so complicated, Parkinson's. Like, how can my medications hope to treat this thing that has dozens of symptoms? I just thought I need a whole body therapy. I need something complicated to fight a complicated disorder. I need something that restores, that doesn't just suppress or attack uh, an abnormal protein in their cells. And I thought, well, let's just get this going and see if we can transform the metabolism in these people. So I pitched the idea to, to my colleagues and they were supportive because they were supportive in general and uh, Parkinson's nurse and so on. They were supportive and we applied for ethics and got a bit of funding. These trials are very cheap to run. So, you know, they're not like medication trials, extremely cheap and it all worked. And New Zealand was really great place for doing this. I think I, I'm not sure I could have um, done the ethical approval process in the States or Canada because there may have been other issues there. But anyways, it all happened then we just went for it. And the Parkinson's trial was really the results of that made me go, okay, maybe there's something to this and maybe, because I could see them, right? I could see them uh, at every so assessment. So, so you've, not part what, of what, 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 you've got improvements and, and what, what do those look like? Yeah. Well, look, I'm, I'm all about clinically significant improvements. You can get statistically significant ones, uh, but, but clinically significant means it's, it's, pretty obvious to anyone who knows that person. And I was seeing definite, to my mind, definite improvements, trying not to fool myself, but I was seeing improvements in a number of these patients, not all of them, but most of them. And uh, so I just thought uh, at the end of that trial that it was so promising that, and, and, and now I look at the, the ketogenic diet protocol, we had those guys on and it wasn't that, it was very strict and more difficult than what we use now, much more. And still they had improvements. So I thought, well, what if we could um, expand this to other disorders such as Alzheimer's? And then I thought, well, mitochondria dysfunction is, is the underlying disorder we're actually treating, and it just manifests differently in neurons producing neurodegeneration as it does in other cells in which it tends to produce cancer or, or atherosclerosis if it's in endothelial, you know, endothelial cells of the arteries and so on. Then maybe I should branch out into cancer as well, uh, uh, cancers of the brain. And Serona, uh, the patient that you mentioned with the uh, metastatic cancer that has had such excellent success, was a part of the trigger for that. 
then uh, that led me to uh, do this all sort of alternating strategy of working on trials in neurodegenerative disorders and cancer trials, of which we're running one right now. And that's sort of how it all happened. So can we just talk a little bit about Serona? And I think she's been quite public about this and you mentioned to her. Uh, yep. And just talk about that case. But I, I find this an astonishing thing. Um, you know, I just keep telling all the people who are prepared to listen to me every day I bump them about this. Um, I don't know if they want to hear it, but I keep telling them about Serona. Uh, you know, I, was, I was really moved, actually. In fact, I was in tears when, I, when you guys did your presentation. So, Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, that's uh, great to hear that you, you, it impacted you so much. I think her story is very powerful on an on a emotional or even a spiritual level. And I try to keep things factual myself because I think uh, different people respond to things differently. So, uh, Serona, uh, has a, had, had a, she was only 37. Long story short, she had just had a baby and she was diagnosed with a metastatic thymoma, which is a cancer of the originates from the thymus gland. And it was a size of a small football in her lung. And it was seeding to the pleura, the, the lining around the lung. And, and she was basically given a very poor prognosis of approximately one year with chemotherapy. And surgery was not an option. It was too complex, the tumor. And radiotherapy was neither. So she decided, um, we just met some semi-serendipitously. She wouldn't say it was serendipitous. She would say it was due to other factors uh, a couple of weeks later. And uh, we just talked about what are the approaches. I mean, she was not keen on a year of chemotherapy side effects uh, and then, you know, saying goodbye to her new daughter and husband, amazing guy. She, she, she had a, uh, after I, I one, guess when people talk about a terminal diagnosis, that's, she had a diagnosis of terminal cancer. Oh, right? big time, big time yeah. terminal diagnosis. She was given a year and the oncologist was writing in letters, uh, you know, she expects her to come to the ED with, uh, this particular complication, uh, of a, uh, pericardial effusion. So the, the tumor basically with these things get so big, it starts to really, um, impinge on the heart and then you die from that. So anyways, uh, we, we, she was very brave. Uh, she still is. And she decided to do a hardcore fasting ketogenic diet protocol, basically a seven day fast every month with a keto diet in between. It was not a, it was a bumpy road. People can look at the paper, uh, if you go to the metabolic neurologist.com site, it's on there. Uh, it was a bumpy road, but basically she's now over five years since that. Uh, really great quality of life, and uh, she she's still doing the fasting keto, and uh, I, I think um, I'm hoping that you know there's a little bit of tumor there, but most of it's gone, it's regressed, and the enhanced immune system function may be a part of that, as well as the theoretical uh, benefits of fasting and keto on cancer themselves. I think there are three main benefits of fasting and keto on tumors outside of the immune system function. And uh, we'll see how we go. But I, I think I feel I, you never you got to be humble and and be sure be remember you don't know everything that maybe things could go really bad and she might have real problems next year. But I feel good. I think she feels good. We both think that uh, she's on a good path, and I'm tr starting to translate the strategy she used that we um, uh, saw with had so much success there in other people. And I'm focusing on glioblastoma multiform now, which is a terrible brain cancer. And, uh, you know, so far it's kind of early days in that trial, but so far we're going good, well there too. So that's how the whole cancer, um, aspect to the research began with Serona. One thing I've noticed with cancer, and I've had to go through this with my dad, talking to his oncologist and other things, he had, a, you know, metastatic prostate cancer, I was counting 18 tumors in one lung, uh, is mm. when you mention any sort of metabolic therapy, they really just eyes glaze over. And then you talk to them about this around this and other patients and their response is sort of like, oh, the, yeah, I don't really get it. It might not work. Uh, they'll say things to the patient, like just eat every, you know, think you want to make sure you keep your energy up, which is appalling advice so far as I'm concerned. Um, it or is, even if they do, is, even yeah. if even if they do understand something about the mechanism to go, well, there's no point mentioning it because they won't do it. Which in my, my mind is unethical to not mention the best possible treatments. Uh, we're certainly happy to mention, you know, removing parts of the body and uh, uh, blasting people with a you know a, a potentially deadly poison and the state of, state of chemotherapy and that sort of thing. Why, why do you think 
that happens, why do you think people are unwilling to mention these therapies? Okay, this is such a great question. And, you know, I used to think the main reason we don't adopt fasting keto is because of financial reasons that, you know, drug companies, it's hard for any company to make money out of fasting protocol. But I think that's number two reason. The number one reason goes back to what your question. So before I answer that question, what that number one reason is, basically, here's how we treat cancer at this point in time. We use surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy to kill the tumor cells. And they are very good at that. I think they are very good. And that's the idea of medicine as uh, attacking diseases. That's the model we base our current medical system on pretty much for all disease, dis diseases, disorders, I call them, rather than diseases. So you try to kill the cancer cells. Fasting keto make life difficult for cancer cells. They take away their main fuel source, which is glucose. They create a lot of ketones in the body, which maybe have some... Um, antagonistic effects against the tumor too. But the more important uh, aspect of fasting keto, these metabolic strategies, is not their ability to kill tumors, in my opinion, it is the ability to promote health throughout the entire, in this case, uh, you know, glioblastoma, say, brain and body. So this, what they do is they make the normal cells go into stress resistant mode, protects them from the chemo and radiation themselves, which are damaging. The cancer cells cannot enter this stress resistant mode. They keep dividing. Why? They are cancer. That's what they do. And maybe they become more susceptible because their fuel so supply is choked. Third thing, and this is where I take it further than uh, pretty much anyone else, to my knowledge, I think what we have to do with uh, cancer is not just heal the cells uh, of the two uh, around the tumor, kill the tumor or heal the cells around the tumor, protect the normal cells around the tumor. We have to kill, try and heal the cells in the whole organ or body. So you want to allow the mitochondria in different parts of the brain to undergo mitogenesis, mito mitophagy, and heal themselves up. Obviously, a person who's aged 45, who 45, who gets a glioblastoma multiform has a problem to begin with. There is some problem in their brain that resulted in this tumor. Someone who gets Alzheimer's has a problem and you're just focusing on the tumor is not gonna fix the greater problem. And hence recurrence is coming a year or two years later. We wanna prevent the recurrences. So that's the whole thing. Now, why when you pitch this to answer your question, I'm getting there to someone uh, first of all, they don't understand anything what I just said. So you have to explain the mechanism and the theory behind it very carefully and over and over. But more importantly than that, and you and you will understand this because I believe you have a background in psychology, is changing the, the number one problem with the why fasting keto are not involved in the medical system today is the dogma that pervades medical thinking. We believe that uh, attacking diseases whether it's Alzheimer's or cancer or atherosclerosis, attacking these weird little targets like LDL or genetic mutations or proteins in the brain is the way to try and cure the, this, this disease. And that is not uh, what I believe now. I believe the way is to restore health. If you restore health, any perceived disease which is basically a response to poor health, should, in many cases, fizzle away. Now, we know this happens in type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. But uh, can it happen in cancer, Alzheimer's? I don't know, maybe to a lesser extent. But most people in this medical system, even in medical students, believe that doctors are here to remove disease. And it's not the way. So if doctors believe this, it's very hard for patients to believe in a different strategy. You have to change the psychology of someone before you start these therapies. Uh, you can't just say to someone who's been doing three meals a day, high processed carbs for their entire life and they're 60 years old, start a five-day fasting protocol every month eat once a day, and to make sure it's a ketogenic diet. You can't just do that without changing the psychology first. But if you can change the psychology, these people can do anything. Yeah, although that, that's just so interesting. I, I pretty much agree with everything you've said. I, I suppose the only problem with psychology, the way psychology operates within the medical field as well, just to say that, is that they also think that removing distress is the answer to being well, which is complete rubbish, of course, because distress is a completely normal part of a normal life. So what you're actually trying to build up is resilience. Um, and even the word resilience is stupid. You're actually yes. trying to make pe people more anti-fragile in, in that sense. So that exactly. so they're stronger exactly. and stronger. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so you, we're arguing for a similar yeah, that, thing there that you, you're, you're asking for a, a less, a, a more anti-fragile body. I'm really glad you brought up that concept because that is what it's about. Like, uh, I don't know if everyone knows about 
the concept of anti-fragile. I'm happy to talk a bit about that yeah, if yeah, you yeah, want to. It. You can. Yeah. Yeah. So there, uh, I believe there was, uh, his uh, name was uh, Taleb, I believe, uh, an author, I hope I got the name right, who wrote this book called Anti-Fragile some time ago, a few years ago. At least that's where I heard of the concept from his book called Anti-Fragile. And basically the concept is uh, we often think of things, uh, fragile things, as things that break under some kind of stress or pressure. And if you ask a person what's the opposite of fragile, most people would say robust or solid or resilient, as you said. But in fact, that is uh, not the case. You could say a rock is robust or stable and it does not break under pressure. Um, but they, a thing that is resilient or robust and stable just stays the same under pressure. Whereas a, he wanted, this author wanted to know what gets stronger under pressure. And things that get stronger under pressure, he, I believe he tried to find a word for it and he couldn't find one. So he made up the word and said, things that get stronger under pressure are anti-fragile. And then he started to look and he saw examples of this uh, often in nature and in life. For example, a... Uh, certain species of tree that requires a forest fire in order for its uh, cones or seeds to uh, uh, release, uh, germinate and create new trees. You know, the, it's everywhere. So the concept is that when bad things happen, such as getting a cancer diagnosis, there is a way to take advantage. Of, there's always a silver line and always an advantage to the gain. You just have to find it and have this anti-fragile psychology, this anti-fragile mindset and, and pursue that and not focus on the disadvantages, the perceived disadvantages of, of that thing. And it's so key to the psychology to develop an anti-fragile mindset and keep focusing on the good, focusing on the positives of this thing. Uh, and eventually I find that the anti-fragile mindset spills over and becomes this really um, self-propelling thing that allows people to do these strategies. So... That's my conception of anti fragile. Yours might be that's different. Brilliant. You've done a fab fabulous job of explaining that. So, I guess this is a good segue to, to go into the sort of new era of medicine that you're advocating for. If, I think the last three, three or four big yeah. things we've talked about all point in that direction. And I, uh, I think there's a, a, a YouTube that's just come out of a talk you've just done. Um, there's your paper that was just published in 2022 that's uh, on the Metabolic Neurologist website. You know, tell us. Where uh, a, a sort of summary of where you've been going with that, because I, you know, this to me is is it's going to be revolutionary in medicine. I think our job now is to help you get this across the line because I think your vision is amazing. Well, Grant, I think you've been doing this longer than me. This uh, conception of medicine is not just the absence of disease, but as the promotion of health. So I think I've just, uh, for me, I was a, the paper that you mentioned that came out a month ago uh, was just a way for me to wrap up a lot of the concepts in my head and pre present them in one paper, which is not that easy and allowed me to put all the fasting and ketogenic diet evidence together and so on. So the basic concept is that for the last 200 years, we've had a germ, uh, this thing called germ theory, where germs cause disease, and I'm not against that theory. Uh, created by Louis Pasteur, who was this French uh, scientist. He was not a medical doctor, a scientist. And germ theory, uh, sorry, he didn't create it, but he championed it. And this idea is that uh, you treat germs by killing them. Uh, you treat infectious disease by killing the germs, bacteria, viruses, and so on. And now that theory worked well for infectious diseases, but now the main disorders of the day are not infectious diseases. They're Alzheimer's, they're, they're cancer, they're atherosclerosis, produce, hardening of the arteries, producing heart attacks, and so on. And we're still using Pasteur's germ theory to uh, deal with these disorders. So we're trying to attack the cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, particularly in atherosclerosis. We're trying to attack mutations, remove them in cancer. We're trying to attack these Lewy bodies and amyloid proteins and so on and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and all these other disorders with vaccines and things. And it's, it's flat out not working because the theory is wrong. Now, there was a contemporary to Pasteur. Uh, sorry, the theory is wrong for these disorders. It's not wrong, it's, but it's wrong for these disorders. There was a contemporary to Pasteur called Antoine Bichamp, also French, also a doctor, but also not just a scientist, but a medical doctor. And I think Pasteur looked up to him. He was a few years older. 
Bichamp had an opposite theory at the time called terrain or host theory. And he said, these pathogens, these germs are actually scavengers. They're not the cause of disease. They only get out of control if the terrain, the environment they're in, i.e. the human body, is unhealthy. If the human body is healthy, they cannot establish a foothold and cause these even infectious diseases, which he was talking about at the time. And this is a much more suitable theory for Alzheimer's, cancer, and atherosclerosis today, the lifestyle disorders, and of course, diabetes and all those ones. So it's about making the body stronger, the body healthier, the terrain, the host better. And how do you do that? It's the mitochondria, in my opinion. Bichamp did not know about mitochondria. He could not identify a target. And for that reason, he lost the debate. And that's why terrain theory, we don't get taught about that in medical school. Nobody knows about it. I didn't know about it until a few years back. So the paper is about how expanding on terrain theory, which basically sees, to my mind, mitochondria dysfunction as the main disorder underlying all of the other lifestyle disorders, not all disorders, but the lifestyle ones, which are the main ones. And if we could treat the mitochondria dysfunction by restoring health of the mitochondria, we could find that maybe we could do a whole lot of good. That's the paper in a nutshell. And of course, all the details are, are in the paper. Yeah. And I just thoroughly commend people with this paper. It's just, it, it's, it's a really good paper. So congratulations for doing it. They, I just want to Thank take you. a back step though, because the, the idea of terrain theory and communicable disease as well is a thing, right? Because do you, or do you think it's a thing? That's my question. Because oh, what you see, what you see is people will get a virus, and some people, you know, get through it the exact same dose of, of a virus or a, a bacteria. Some people succumb to it and die, and others end up dealing with it without any symptoms. Is that because their terrain is in better shape? Grant, you you just so we're gonna get into uh, COVID and C nineteen. I'm sure about it, and maybe the flu virus and so on. And I'm happy to do that because this is this is the elephant in the room in the last few years. So absolutely, if you have a strong ter like, we know that a lot of people get COVID or the flu uh, virus and they get very sick, uh, but many people don't. And uh, I'm not sure if I've had it. I've had no symptoms of any flu for over a. Uh, a decade longer now. And I'm, if I had C19, I wouldn't know it. So, uh, you know, why, why is that? Exactly. It's not just germs cause disease. If that was the case, everyone who was positive for a uh, flu virus or C19 would be sick and they're not. So the terrain theory is more important and, and more fundamental, even in the infectious disorders, I believe most infectious disorders, certainly the viruses. So, has, if um, I, I, I fully agree with you there. And uh, the elephant in the room here is that we talk about masks and vaccines and lockdowns and so on, but the elephant in the room is that if you have optimal metabolic health, and not a lot of people truly understand that most, the vast majority of people in the West have at least one or two of the metabolic syndrome risk factors. Uh, if you are truly optimized metabolically, I do not think that uh, these viruses have uh, much of a chance of, of causing you a, a health problem is certainly not putting you in a hospital. And so this has been, this is a greatest chance for us to promote these metabolic strategies. And I believe it will happen, but it's just going to take a long time because of all the misinformation out there, all the people who stand to gain from the current uh, model, which is substantial as well, uh, we have to get around those people as well. I, 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 I suppose I've been incredibly frustrated over the last two and a half years about the lack of discussion about yeah about sorting out the terrain, as you so nicely put it, and I suppose you're in the same situation. Grant, you're to be commended for the work you do. I've seen a little bit of what you uh, do. You do a lot of, um, you, you, you've spoken about this a lot in the last two or three years, uh, uh, potentially to your own detriment, although I think you're very careful and you make sure you're doing the right thing for everyone. But uh, yeah, I fully uh, agree with that, that, that maybe this is the time where we should be um, focusing on health even more rather than going the opposite. We're running in the wrong direction already. And we've decided to double our speed by doing more vaccinations and more masks and more lockdowns. We should, when things are going bad, you should not continue down the path faster. You should stop and think and maybe turn around and go the other way. So I would like to see that more. I admit some people are doing that thanks to yourself and others, but we'll need more. I believe it will happen, but it's going to take time. Do you reckon that's because? Random, random idea, but do you reckon it's because people just don't understand in the world 
like you get a cubic center of seawater and it's got oh, some ridiculous number of bacteria and viruses in it. If you went to look at, I'm looking at my carpet now, who knows what's in there, but you know, you, 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 you sanitize your hands. Um, you know, if, if you're looking to get away from bacteria and viruses, you need to go to another planet really, so far as I can tell. Exactly. It's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Be, you need to be in outer space. And even then you, you've got all these uh, bacteria and viruses in your gut, right? And, and other parts of your body. So it's impossible. We live with them. They live with us. And, and, and um, in many ways, they live I, in a symbiosis with us. In, indeed. And so, yes, I agree. It's a concept. It's the paradigm. It's the psychology. Again, coming back to that, you have to change how, what, how people view health and disease. What is health? What is it? A lot of people say they want to be healthy, but they don't understand. I don't think we have a good definition for what that really is. And, and um, it's the way we conceive of, uh, of, of life, uh, health and disease in general. That's the problem. And if, if we could take the definition away, like healthy is not just absence of disease. It's actually something much deeper than that. Then maybe we'd have more success. But there are a lot of competing interests here, as you know, um, in terms of uh, companies and, and media and so on that uh, have a lot to a lot of financial interests uh, as well. So we can't ignore that. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a, a massive problem. Hey, I want to finish with a couple of interesting topics. I think sort of side topics. I, I saw a paper, and I think I sent it too to you, about this idea of pathogen-induced Warburg effect, that, that you get a virus or another infection, and it induces this sort of mitochondrial shift. And it might only be a temporary one, it's hard to tell, but what, did you have a look at that? What do you make of that idea? Yeah, no, uh, thank you for sending me the paper. So I think uh, part of the paper was the idea that the war, there's a Warburg-like so for people that don't know the Warburg effect, it's where you have um, in a cell, uh, the glycolysis, so all the energy production outside of the mitochondria accelerates by, say, 10 to 100 times. So it, 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 uh, it's thought to be, in my opinion, there's different uh, views on this. I think it's a compensatory mechanism for the mu damaged mitochondria largely. Mm. So it allows a cell to survive but uh, with damaged mitochondria. And this happens in cancer. Uh, the paper you sent me shows that it probably happens a little bit in atherosclerosis, which would make sense if, if uh, in atherosclerosis there's some mitochondria damage, you should have a Warburg-like mechanism there too. Neurons can't do it because they don't have the glycolytic machinery to do any Warburg. So they, to my knowledge, don't exhibit any Warburg effect. And this all makes sense from the, the mitochondria perspective. What The, the trick is um, a, a correlation versus causation. And so many times, scientists are very prone to this too, which is, should not be the case, is that causation is inferred when you have only a correlation. For example, the example I use is Parkinson's and smoking. We know that uh, people with Parkinson's smoke less. Does that mean I can actually recommend people to smoke more with Parkinson's and it might make them better? No, it does not. It's a correlation only. And so with the Warburg mechanism you mentioned, do the infections change the mitochondria and the Warburg effect, or is there some mitochondria damage there which results in the Warburg-like mechanism? And then the infections, we know that viruses and bacteria are, are rife in atherosclerotic lesions and other parts of the body. Do they sort of take advantage of that somehow and, and accelerate their growth? I, so I have no doubt the correlations there. What is the cause of link? That's my interest. Right, because terrain theory would... Yeah, suggests that that can definitely happen the other way around, right? Uh, yeah, so you can you correct could work exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. So that's actually a really good point, and I hadn't yeah. um, been thinking about that when I was reading that, but that's a really good point. Well, that's the thing. When we as scientists, we often get very uh, hung up on the mechanisms, and we talk about this and that, and then it's so tempting. The human brain loves to make causal uh, inferences. The human brain is a guess-based machine. It is not a uh, deductive reasoning machine logic. It is not even an inductive reasoning machine very much, which is probability based. It is abductive reasoning, guess based. Our brain makes guesses and we often guess this causes this and we're often wrong. And so uh, that's why I think a lot of these um, uh, things go south for years is that people guess that LDL cholesterol is the cause of atherosclerosis. And then you've got years and decades of people trying to prove this when it doesn't actually maybe exist. And uh, yeah, that's that I, that's a big interest of mine too, is just trying to go with uh, 
That's why it's important to look at results first, then facts, then expert opinion. The facts can be confusing on their own. You know, you got correlations, but you don't got causation. Oh, this 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 takes me back to my days when I used to teach in a psychology department. I had to teach this behavioral neuro, neuropsychology stuff, and you know, one thing that you would say there, and you see this in animals and humans, right? Is that we're hardwired when when something they call it adventitious reinforcement. So so when something ex, a stimulus ex, accidentally turns up next to something else. Um, you know, it's just contiguous with it, um, then what you would say to the students is that we're hardwired to assume contingency uh, when something is only contiguous. In other words, it, it's, been in our, it's been in our survival mechanism to assume cause um, when it's only accidentally, it's only associated in time because, you know, this could be life-saving. Uh, and because we've always been in a better safe than sorry environment, uh, up until recently, then that's probably a good idea, right? Yeah. So it's like, and a simple example is a forest, uh, a house on fire and an ambulance, uh, fire truck, fire truck. So we know that houses on fire tend to be cause, cause, I guess they, in that they precede the arrival of a fire truck. But if you just looked at a snapshot of that, you might say, because there's a fire truck always at a house on fire, the fire truck causes the fire. And that's what we're doing with like, say, proteins in Alzheimer's and genetic mutations in cancer and LDL in atherosclerosis. We're saying just because these things are always together, this causes that. The fire engine caused the fire. It's just, as you say, that's it, uh, adventitious thinking. And then you, you're just, the brain loves to make causal inferences. It guesses all the time. That's what it does. So we just have to yeah, try yeah. and resist that as scientists. Okay, let's finish off with a really big question that we've both possibly got the rest of our lives to try and get there on. How, how do we make progress here in medicine? How's that going to happen? Because the sort of things we're talking about uh, are life-changing, mind-blowing, yeah, interesting, uh, yeah, are the reason that we're both in these fields that we're in, that we, we want to be in a space where we help people have a decent health span. But uh, actually, frankly, you know, if, uh, I'm... My watch, things have probably got worse. People have fatter, sicker, more better bulk than well. So I feel like I've yep. made little to no difference. Yeah. What, what do you reckon? What are we going to do? Well, first of all, I'd say I disagree with what you said at the end. I think you're making a big difference. But look, Grant, I think, uh, first of all, my honest answer is I don't know because uh, let's see what happens. But if you read history, that's probably the best thing. People that... Um, initiated transformative changes that affected many other people in a good way or a bad way. First, transform themselves. So you have to be the thing that you uh, want to um, support. So I think you have to first, one has to become a strong advocate of metabolic strategies, fasting, keto, exercise uh, protocols, proper ones in their own lives. And then uh, change their own psychology to truly believing it if it is something that is worth believing. Then you find allies. And I think a number of older, uh, I have a number of older guys who are great supporters uh, and allies. And then you also um, try to um, appeal to the younger people. Uh, younger doctors and medical students are interested in this stuff and they're not too brainwashed yet, so they have a chance. Then you don't make massive enemies. You try, if someone <laughs> looks like they could be really offended by what you're saying, or they're just not anywhere near ready to, um, or emotion is getting in the way, then that's just, I completely respect people who disagree with me. I often try to learn from their opinion and decide, is it, is, are they right? I might be wrong. But if it's, if I think I am right after, upon reflection and they're not right, then I don't push it. And I just let people... Um, make up their own minds. It's it's a free country, or it, it's supposed to be. And so eventually, some of these people will come around, some won't, and that's okay. And then you spread the message in a constructive fashion. You do the work, which is results-based. So that's the trials. That's the studies that are showing that maybe there's something to this. And I think you just have to focus on that. And there's a joy in focusing on, on that, helping people get better when nothing else was going to help them. I, it's amazing. I it's a self sustaining thing uh, for for the work. And once you get into that phase, then I don't see there. I, I think I could do what I'm doing the rest of my life, even if I lived to you know a hundred or even longer. And I would just be 
loving it every step of the way. That's not to say it's easy. There are many, many canyons and abysses and, and dark periods in terms of uh, trying to find, help people. Like things don't always go as planned. But in overall, I think that the path is a good one. And then maybe at some point, enough people uh, start to do this kind of thing that suddenly you get this uh, inflection point where you know these things can happen very quickly. Suddenly you get this whole uh, look at the you know the fall of the Berlin Wall, for example. Mm. It, it didn't. Mm. It just all happened very quickly. The Soviet Union fell apart very quickly, but it was a buildup of decades coming to it. It may be the same here. Suddenly, over a few years, everything changes, and now we can find we can really enhance the health and wisdom of humanity for the better. That's my hope and that's my dream. And I th let's see if we can do it. Fabulous. I, there's a couple of things I forgot to ask you before. That just reminded me of one of them. It's like, I mean, I do research uh, and I do a bit of teaching, but I, I don't do a, you know, a clinical load and I'm not on call and doing shifts and all these things. I, frankly, man, I, I wonder how, how do you even do this? How do you manage to publish these papers to clinical trials and do all that other crazy doctoring stuff? Because you guys are known for working hours that uh, that resemble anything that anyone else in the world would be willing to do. Yeah. I guess uh, one must be uh, believe in, in the idea, the concept, and then it's a matter of making sacrifices. So you have to sacrifice other areas of your life at least temporarily, that could consume vast amounts of time and or brain power. So, you know, you I've I've made I made a few sacrifices. And then I realized uh, as I went along, if I was gonna do a mix of clinical neurology and research, and I do a lot of teaching too, and and those things all feed into each other. Um, if I was going to keep doing that with the research ballooning more and more, I would have to make sacrifices in other areas of life, which I have. And it was more sacrifice than I anticipated. And uh, I think you just have to go all in if you're going to do it and uh, focus on other things like your sleep. Um, fortunately, the metabolic strategies, I find the fasting uh, keto diet allows me, you know, they're, they augment my lifestyle so much. It helps propel the research about them. So I don't have to eat much. I don't have to, I feel very good and focused and cognitively well. I'm in excellent, or I think I'm in excellent health and good shape. I do a very specific high intensity exercise regimens at certain point points. Uh, and so all these things, uh, come, you just have to be, believe in the one idea and go a hundred percent, not 90%. I think Arnold Schwarzenegger wrote a good book a few years ago where he said, forget plan B. If you want to do something, Go plan A, because if you have a plan B, you'll go 90% on plan A. I don't have a plan B. My plan A is this, and I'm going 100% on this, and let's just see what happens. I, it oh, could I crash it, and burn, it. but so far, so good. Yeah. Yeah, so, so far, so good. All right. Uh, very, very last little thing is just a quick discussion about exercise and fitness and the metabolic effects. We, we, we sort of didn't get time to do this at the end of your talk, but I'd, I'd sort of, you were advocating that, uh, you're a fan of high intensity exercise and I think some resistance. And I agree with that. Those are very good things and especially functionally good for you. Uh, I also think there's some benefit around, uh, the sort of zone two type of endurance work, especially if you think around, uh, the idea of mitochondrial health, because it, it yeah, uh, so far as I, I was concerned if I had to be asked about the mechanisms as why if it, people who have high cardiovascular fitness you know, tend to live 10 years longer or so than people who have low cardiovascular fitness and uh, they have an extra dozen or so years of, of, of quality, healthy life, then we, if we were thinking around your terrain theory, I think that then you know, mito there's mitochondrial benefits from that type of exercise. And I think your response is like, well, there's also harms from that type of exercise. Um, where, where, where are you sitting on all that? Yeah, so I'll, I'm going to preface this by saying, you know a lot about exercise uh, that I don't, and I haven't done a deep dive uh, into exercise, like a really deep one yet. But to my mind, um, yeah, I think you can take it, uh, the exercise, you can take it too far. You can take fasting and keto diets too far too, though, right? So 
my perspective is if you look at the data, ultra athletes, these guys who, who spend several hours a day, six to seven days a week, um, very, you know, uh, onerous exercise regimens, they actually have poor health outcomes. So although they are very fit individuals, they're not necessarily healthy. So first of all, I think although these two concepts overlap to a significant extent, fitness and health are not quite the same. You can be very fit and not that healthy and probably vice versa. So um, that's where I come at it from. And then if you look at that, what does exercise do? If you do high intensity exercise or a long run at anything uh, beyond zone, well, even zone two, you're going to be unleashing lots of reactive oxygen species, free radicals at higher levels, uh, you know, ages and things like that, that are damaging to mitochondria. Now, it's not the exercise that makes you healthier. The exercise um, is damaging. It's the recovery period that makes you healthier. So I think, um, first of all, when I say exercise, I advocate long recovery periods between the exercise intervals which uh, is against the ethos of anyone trying to, to do something for a certain goal. So, but if the goal is to become so fit that you are the strongest man at this or the fastest man at that, then, then that's okay. That's a, its own goal. But if your goal is health, then exercise should not be, uh, should have long intervals. And then the type of exercise, I go for short period bursts that have the maximum benefit for hormesis and like mitochondria hormesis and you know, hormesis in general, which is stress that makes you stronger that doesn't kill you, you know? So, uh, and, and that's <laughs> what I, I think, I think the exercise should vary. So you should, uh, so example, I do a lot of body weight exercise. I'll do handstands and L sits one day. And then the next day I'll do, uh, some, uh, his pistol squats and, and leg workout stuff. And then the next day, something else completely. And you don't even do the same abs or chest ex exercises every time you mix them up. So mixing everything up. So there's no major weak point. You're flexible. The mitochondria health is not going to be a zone two enhances mitochondria, biomass and muscle. It makes the mitochondria more, but that is not the right outcome measure. The right outcome measure for mitochondria health is not the number of mitochondria. It is their is going to be, it has to be defined, but it's optimized yeah. function in terms of fusion and fission. And uh, it's, it's their ability to couple and uncouple. And so those are the things that matter to me when I talk about health. And so I think exercise can be very pro for that, but uh, too much in the wrong type can be against that. I'm sorry that was so long, but no, no, it's good. I, I, and I, you I, may have different, I, yeah. Well, I know, I think I pretty much agree with what you're saying. I think, I think that, that easy, long movement, which I think that the counter of to that argument is that uh, while you see those effects that you're talking about in, in modern humans, the, the problem is that those modern humans are, you know, generally just powering that with, you know, refined carbohydrates, you know, and actually taking these extra gels and all these sorts of sports strengths and these sorts of things. So that, that's a very different environment than doing, you know, long, easy, uh, I don't know, uh, persistence hunting or something. Uh, when you when you mm -hmm. when you when you're fasted or you know on a on a carbohydrate low carbohydrate diet because that's all that you had when you're uh, you know, eating that type of uh, hunter gatherer type situation and so and these weren't races that you know you didn't you know go to your collapsed over the line you were actually trying to conserve energy uh, more than anything else so that that might be a, a quite a different metabolic milieu than what you see in these modern athletes I think there's even more evidence that that you know, particularly elite marathon runners uh, you know, get you know, quite profound cardiac tissue damage and, and inflammation that is actually very unhealthy. And I don't, I think, I think this is one of the things in elite sport that we think of these people as being fit uh, and healthy as the same thing. And you've got a very good point there. I think the Olympic Games is a great example of that. I mean, just the poor mental health for a start of um, these people is, is, yeah, it seems obscene to be putting that on young people, that type of thing. So I agree with all that, but I think there, there might be some complexities in the metabolic exercise outcomes of easy. Uh, there's certainly, there's certainly benefits for just being out in nature independent of anything else and you know, being in the water or yeah, uh, yeah, the forest and these sorts of things. And so, yeah, those are other factors to think about as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're a long distance runner and you just love the runner's high and you love being in nature when you run that, who am I to argue against that? I don't think it's particularly healthy metabolically, but if you love it, that's a good reason in and of itself. Yeah. There's a, there's a friend of mine actually, Steve, who's, who's you know, done these Ironman triathlons his whole life. He's in his sixties now. 
And I actually think it's getting to the point where it's not very good for him and it hasn't been for a while, but it's a good point. He, he loves it. Uh, so I've sort of gone, well, who's better? You know, he'd rather do that. So, yeah. okay, I think we're coming to yeah. an end, Matt. So, hey, That's thanks right. so much. It's been awesome. So, yeah. It's tremendous. Be. Thank you very much, Grant. Thanks yeah. Uh, yeah. very much. Yeah. You've been listening to Preventionist Cure, brought to you by Precure.com with me, Professor Grant Schofield.